I like to think of kind of everything that I do as a, as a feedback loop. So starting at the beginning of the feedback loop is the, the physical work that I do, kind of having my hands in the soil. Um, I am the co-manager of Emerald Street Urban Farm in Kensington with my lovely wife, Elisa. I also work for the Department of Parks and Recreation, uh, doing workforce development and land care management. Now that's very, very sacred work that's very close to my spirit, but sometimes I have to admit I have a hard time seeing the value in what I do without thinking about what I'm doing, writing about what I'm doing, being creative about the work that I do. So that kind of leads to the other side, and that's the writing. Um, in 2011, I published my first novel, Seeds of Descent. It's about urban farming in West Philadelphia. I have a short story collection about urban farming in Kensington coming out next fall. I write articles for magazines, and then we have the head in the hand press. But with all those things that I do, I sometimes can't see the value in that if I'm not doing the work, and that kind of com completes the feedback loop. So that's what I do. So we would be thinking that I'm at a food conference and I should probably talk about the first part of the feedback loop, the urban farming, but actually what I'm here to talk to you guys about is the publishing. So as uh, was said, I'm the founder of the Head in the Hand Press. I founded this in 2012, been around for a few years. We're an independent publisher and we publish titles just like this. We do uh, novels by people from in Philadelphia and beyond. We also do a series of almanacs. We revived that old genre that was created here in Philadelphia oh so long ago. Uh, and we bring in artists and writers to do poems, essays, short stories, art, all around certain themes. Our next one coming out is called the Asteroid Belt Almanac. It's all about science and technology. Uh, we also put out chat books that we sell in vending machines in places in the city. We try to do a lot of very fun, innovative things. And the place where we do that is in our workshop. So in Kensington, we have a workshop. Uh, it's called the Head in the Hand Work Writers Workshop, and we do a few things there. The first is, as you can see, we give space to writers to come in and work on any project that they want to work on. Uh, the second part is connecting those writers. So connecting them to this larger literary community that they can be a part of. The third part is giving them access to our editorial staff and other people that we know in publishing to then give them the opportunities to get published. And I'm very proud to say that we've published a lot of authors right from our workshop. And the fourth part is having a place to exhibit their work to people in Philadelphia through readings and things like that. But the most important thing that we do is collaboration. We thrive on that in this company. It kind of goes with that whole thinking and doing thing that I talked about before. So we call ourselves a craft publishing company, and we call ourselves that because we believe that writers are artisans, much like a carpenter or a farmer. And just like a farmer sees the crop go through from the seed to the harvest, we think that a writer should have collaboration in the production system of a book from when the first word hits the page to when the first book leaves the shelf. So believe me, all this is going to come back up in the talk, and I'm going to make the kind of conversion over to why this has to do with food in a little bit. But before I do that, I want to get into a math lesson. So what I'm going to do here tonight is uh, something very, very, I would almost call it historic, because as I learned when I wrote my business plan for this company, no publisher anywhere will ever give you their actual numbers. So I'm actually going to give you guys our numbers today. Um, and the other part is that I want everybody to remember is what we're making off of the end of this book is what we have to run the entire company. So the first thing we're going to start with is our writers. Our writers, they make 10% off of the list price of a book. Now, that might seem like a paltry sum, but in the industry standard for a paperback book, which is pretty much all we do because hardbacks are too cost prohibitive, we, uh, they usually pay 8%. We pay 10 because, like I said, we're a craft publisher. We believe in collaboration and getting buy-in from our authors. I'd also like to point out that we pay on the gross and not the net, meaning that they're getting 10% off that list price no matter how we sell the book, retail or wholesale. The next is our printing. We're on a small scale economy as a small publisher. So unlike bigger publishing companies that have a lot of money, deep pockets, and a lot of track record in the industry, knowing how many do these big runs of 10,000 books, we're doing runs of about 1,000 books. And that's taking our printing costs to a pretty high percentage, 16% off that list price. Then we have to give 40% to a place called Baker & Taylor. Now, Baker & Taylor is a huge wholesale distributor. And I like to make the uh, joke that it doesn't matter if you're Barnes & Noble or the most anarchist bookstore you can think of, everyone's getting their books from Baker & Taylor. It's a very easy system where they can go on one website and get all the titles that they want and then pay flat out. I will say that we are very blessed to have a few shops here in Philadelphia that do buy from us directly and they're huge supporters of ours. But anywhere else around the country, we go through Baker & Taylor. Then we have Amazon. Now, I'm sure everyone in this room has brought multiple books from Amazon. I won't hold that against anybody, believe me. Um, they take a 45% cut when we sell through them. And then our distributor. So our distributor is our connection to Baker and & Taylor and Amazon. 
Amazon you can kind of get into as a publisher uh, directly, but when it comes to bookstores, as we said, you have to go through Baker and Taylor and you have to go through our distributor to get to Baker and Taylor. They take a 45% cut after the discount to those two entities. So I know those percentages might be a little hard to understand, so here's how I'm going to break it down. We retail a book at $18. That's for a soft cover book. The bookstore is taking $7.20 right off the bat from buying from Baker and Taylor. The distributor is then taking $4.86 off of that book. Our author gets their $1.80 no matter how we sell it, and our printer takes $3. And that leaves us with a whopping grand total of $1.14 we make off of each book when we sell through this system. Now, I wanted to point that out, like I said, this is what we have to run the entire company, people who are doing the um, design, the layout, getting these books out to the world. This is a problem, and we had to start thinking, what do we do? How are we going to solve this problem? So I started thinking back, and I started thinking about another industry that has very similar problems, and that's farming, that I've been in for a long time. So when you think about what, you know, the kinship between farming and publishing, I think it's very, very deep. From a colonial American perspective, publishing and um, agriculture have pretty much been almost the same age. Jamestown's founded in 1607. We start having agriculture in the colonial America in our scale that we're doing it at. Publishing happens in 1640. The first book, as they say, was um, published in uh, New England. It's called the Bay Psalm Book. Um, so they're pretty much almost the same age. Also, I would say that the books, books and food, kind of share a very common heritage in that they're both analog, organic activities that we still do that haven't changed that much. Simply put, We've traded in the horse and buggy for the luxury sedan, but we still eat food and we still read books. So, um, looking at these problems and also thinking about um, where, uh, yeah, so we're still um, reading books, so thinking about where books are, um, sorry, just lost my train of thought for a second. Um, so, and the, but what's not has changed that much is the way that food and books get out to people. And that's what's really changed. And I'm thankful for everyone who's been up here today giving all of those thoughts about, you know, what industrialization has done to the food systems. But I want to point out two things that are really important about um, the way the food gets out to people. One is that large-scale industrial farming thinks that they are the only way that they could feed enough people on this planet. Another thing that industrial farming makes, and they make the claim, is that they are the, almost, the most efficient way that they can get food out to everyone on this planet. Now, this is something very similar that happens in books. Now, what I showed from this example, and I've left this up here so you can see that number again, is that we've been in a system that has the same kind of monopolies. Places like Baker and Taylor and Amazon, they have claimed that they're the only ways that you're able to get books out to people. And as you saw from these numbers, it almost ensures that a small scale operation like ours is bound to fail. I'm also, I'm gonna beat up on Amazon for a little bit more here, but there was a great article in the New Yorker a couple months ago by George Packer. And he talks about kind of what he analyzed as the main point of Amazon. And that is not to produce books, but to track consumer habits. And he makes this claim that they're more interested in having programmers create algorithms that track our consumer habits through the books we buy than the actual books that go up on their site. Now, they claim that they've taken away the keys from the gatekeepers of publishing and given them directly to authors. But I'll argue that by skipping the publishing companies, they've taken out that filter and they've flooded the market with books that sometimes can devalue the actual product of literature that goes out. Now, think about this. Does this sound familiar? What has agribusiness done? It's put more money into food science to create processed foods, and it's also put more money into GMO seeds, not thinking about how to actually grow food naturally. I'd also argue that with this huge abundance that they've created, they've cheapened food both economically and culturally. Now, again, a lot of people have talked about the food side of this. Now, let's talk about what has publishing done to kind of solve these problems. Well, the people who have been around for a very long time and have been in the game, They've adapted, they've learned how to use social media, they've modified a few parts of their production system, and they've been able to exist. Smaller places like myself, or people who are just coming into the game right now, either went out of business, or a lot of them have turned to the nonprofit. Now, this is something, and I want to just take a moment to talk about, because I've thought about this a lot. I struggle with the whole point of becoming a nonprofit. On the book selling side, we've stayed as a for profit business, and I do that because I believe that we're selling good books to adults, able-bodied adults who should be able to pay for those books. But when it comes to the other side of our business, on the workshop, 
we had no other choice but to become a nonprofit. And I believe I am very thankful for the system that we have to be able to do that and the donors and everybody who supports what we do. But I do have some qualms with the nonprofit also. I mean, when you're a for-profit, I feel that they throw you kind of in the shark tank with all the other for-profits who are just trying to make a buck. Never mind that there are some nonprofits where the executive director makes six figures a year, and there's some for-profits that are the cornerstones of their community, like more so than other um, the nonprofits even within the area. So with those two things in mind, we had to think, what could we do? And that's what we did on the one side to become a nonprofit. But on the other side, it still leaves the question, what do we do for the for-profit? How do we make books viable that we can then sell to get out to people? So once again, I racked my brain and I went back to something that I know very well, farming. And this is what I came up with. Back in the 80s and 90s, farmers were faced with very much of the same things. Industrial agriculture was killing small-scale farming and family farms. So a group of people in New England got together and with some inspiration from biodynamic farmers from Europe, they created what's called the CSA. Now I'm sure a lot of people know what the CSA is, Community Supported Agriculture. And the way that it works is that for an upfront cost and an investment from what's called a shareholder, that shareholder then from the farmer gets a box of produce every week or every other week depending on the arrangement. CSAs, they now include meat, vegetable, or meat, dairy, bread, even beer. They also go throughout the winter. But what's more important is that they've turned the person from a consumer into a shareholder and a stakeholder, someone who's going to support that business more so than just buying the product through something as unpredictable as a farming season. So from that idea, I looked back at our problems. Too great of a lag time getting paid by our distributor. Too low of money that we get that we can't fund what we're trying to do. Too much of a volatile marketplace where we don't know how many books we're going to sell because it's so dependent on the press that we get or the reviews that we get. So I went and we started thinking about this and we took this lesson and we created what we call the CSP, Community Supported Publishing. And it works in very much the same way. For, a buy -in, for an upfront investment for the year for $50, the shareholder gets two boxes of books throughout the year. So in the fall, they'll get one of our novels, one of our almanacs, two of our chapbooks, and in the spring, they'll get the same thing. Now, this has been something that's been allowing us to kind of exist as a business, to kind of get that upfront capital, and more importantly, turn consumers into shareholders, people who have a stake in supporting our business. Another lesson that I think is great from the CSA is that when that word started spreading about it and other people wanted to create them, the people who started CSAs, they didn't get together and get lawyers and start sending out cease and desist letters to people who wanted to use the brand. They wanted more people to do it, to retrain consumers from going from just buying food in the grocery store without thinking about where it comes from and buying it directly from a farmer. And that's the same thing we hope to happen with the CSP. I talk to publishers all the time. I would love for more people to adopt this model because it allows them to going from a consumer to a shareholder who's going to care more about that business. You're retraining people to not just to go to Amazon first, but to go directly to the source and buy from it. Now, this is something that I almost have as a vision for many other industries that we can work with within our communities. And this is something that I hope to see spread. But I will say, and I'll give the caveat, that I am thinking about this solely as from a producer standpoint. Now, I understand that you know, there are a lot of great bookstores out there that also have to sell these books, just like there were a lot of grocery stores and co-ops that small farmers didn't want to see to go out of business. So as CSA spread, they were able to really revolutionize the sales and the distribution system to get people to buy directly from either producers or from people who are supporting them into that system. And again, that's what we hope to do, and that's what we hope to see, but we need bookstores to kind of see this with us ourselves and not just be within the distribution systems that we saw before. To have bolder ideas, we have to go past just having local author sections in the back of small bookstores or having reading events that sometimes aren't so greatly attended. We need to have these bolder ideas to start connecting people to get consumer sales direct to the consumers, to retrain consumers to be able to buy directly from us. This is something, as I said, that I think can affect so many different industries. It's something that can take our small downtown main streets, as they call them, and make them places again where independent businesses can work together to, do, to sell and buy and make small items that they can sell back into an economy that's balanced by the needs of the community they exist in. Community by community, business by business, block by block, it takes a community to do this, and we think that CSPs and CSAs are one step to get us closer to that. Thank you all very much.